Hello everyone, we've got another Unearthed Arcana with Jeremy Crawford, and shortly after this video you will have access to that PDF, and we, as always we need your playtest feedback. We have a lot of classes, we have a lot of subclasses, and a whole bunch of stuff to dive into. What, what, are we, what can we expect? So in Unearthed Arcana for the Player's Handbook, and this is number seven, we are returning to the classes that were featured in UA5. So that's the fighter, the barbarian, the sorcerer, the warlock, and the wizard. And now making revisions to those classes based on the feedback we got on UA5. Right. In addition to that, so in addition to getting to see a new take on those five classes, now reflecting feedback we received, we're also including a bunch of other subclasses. So just as we did for the classes that were in UA6, where now suddenly each class uh, had multiple subclasses as a part of the playtest, we're now doing that for these classes as well. And that includes even two brand new subclasses. You're going to see a brand new subclass in the Barbarian called the Path of the World Tree. That's very cool. And also a brand new subclass in the Fighter called the Brawler. Yeah. And these two are really fun subclasses. One of them, the Brawler, is all about being a fighter who specializes in improvised weapons and unarmed strikes. This is the fighter who might spend more time clobbering people with chairs than with conventional weapons, and uh, we think people are going to have a ball with it. And then the Path of the World Tree is a barbarian subclass that delves into the cosmic story of D&D, that there is this world tree that actually connects all worlds, and this barbarian, when they rage, taps into the power of that tree. And one of the, uh, I think, iconic things for this subclass is being able to summon up the roots of the world tree yeah. to pull people toward the barbarian. I, I like to think of people running away from this barbarian and this <laughs> barbarian going, uh-uh, and, and using these mystic roots of the tree to pull people toward them. Yeah. Uh, at higher level, you'll even be able to use the roots of the tree to take yourself and your companions to a teleportation circle elsewhere in the world that you're on, or even to another plane of existence. So this is also a rare case of the Barbarian class in one of its subclasses gaining access to things like planar travel yeah. or, or, te or long distance teleportation. And this is us exploring the edges of each class. Uh, we, we do this with subclasses where we, we sort of pace out the, the outer boundaries of each class and see is there some theme we haven't hit yet in this class? And we're doing that with Path of the World Tree and the Barbarian, as well as in the Fighter. The Fighter's identity has long been the master of weapons and armor, and we realized that something we hadn't explored yet in 5th edition is being the master of also improvised weapons. And so this Fighter is going to be able to pick up all sorts of odds and ends, and then apply weapon mastery properties to them. Uh, so the brawler especially is uh, able to delve into the new weapon mastery system and take some of those properties and apply them to this table leg yeah. or that <laughs> poker from next to the oh, fire. Oh, that's gonna be fun with uh, expertise, yeah. Or, or this broken uh, bottle. Uh, the Brawler is all about taking things in the environment or the Brawler's own body and using those things as weapons. That's perfect. And then we have, again, revised versions of the subclasses in all of these five classes. We also have some uh, revised spells in this UA. Uh, Sorceress Burst and Arcane Eruption return from UA5. Those spells were enjoyed, and so they're here again. They've been tweaked. We also have a new version of Counter Spell for people to try out, right. and a new version of the Jump Spell uh, for people oh, to, to experiment with. Uh, but 
I maybe can talk more about those things once we dive into the classes. <laughs> yeah, so where do you want to start? Do you be like uh, alphabetically? <laughs> yeah, sure. How about we do the barbarian and the fighter first? Okay. Although, before we dive into any particular class, one of the things I should point out that pertains not only to the spellcasters in this Unearthed Arcana, but also the spellcasters who appeared in the previous Unearthed Arcana, UA6. The survey for which is closed, and actually our team is now going through the feedback on right. UA6. A big shift in UA7 is in UA7, we are going back to using class spell lists. We've been having fun for a number of Unearthed Arcanas, experimenting with the arcane, divine, and primal lists. But what we have found is that while those lists worked very well for certain classes, for instance, it was a big boon for the ranger to gain access to the entire primal list, we have found that for other classes, shifting to those big lists tended to dampen their identity. For example, the wizard, a big part of their identity in the game is having the biggest spell list in the game. Right. And by multiple classes now essentially sharing the wizard's spell list, the fan response was understandably that the wizard's identity was being diminished. We also found that with, in this Unearthed Arcana, the return to warlocks having pact magic, that also meant, and that's a spoiler because we haven't gotten to the warlock yet, <laughs> yeah. but yes, warlocks have returned to having pact magic in this UA. Well, a part of that shift means they need to also go back to having their own spell list because given how pact magic works, where you have this constrained set of spell slots that all sort of move up to your yeah. highest level slot, means warlocks must have, when they have pack magic, a heavily curated spell list. Uh, because there are some spells that just become too powerful if you get to just push the fifth level version button of that yeah. over and over and over again. We also have found that as, as much fun as we had experimenting with the Bard, uh, getting to choose from one of those three lists, you right. and I talked about it in a previous video, it's a really neat story idea. We have found that there are some identity degrading characteristics of that for the Bard, and right. so we were also eager to get back to class spell lists for the Bard. So, in summary, you're going to see all the spellcasters in UA7 are back to using class spell lists, and the classes that appeared in UA6 will also go back to using class spell lists. So that's an important overview thing that connects not only to the sorcerer, uh, the warlock, and the wizard who are in UA7, but also to the Eldritch Knight who is in UA7. Right. Uh, because the Eldritch Knight, rather than uh, referring to the arcane spell list, just as the subclass does in 2014, uses the wizard spell list. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the barbarian. I'm really excited for, well, I'm really excited for the new one because I love Idrisil stuff. I love world tree stuff. <laughs> so. so the barbarian, the base class, has received uh, a number of tweaks and enhancements. Danger Sense from 2014, it is back at second level. And we've now made it so that it works even if you have the blinded or deafened condition. Oh, um, nice. We, we yeah. wanted to make it easier for the barbarian to use this feature, particularly given the fact that many barbarian features are, they're not magical per se, but there is an extraordinary quality to them. The barbarian is uh, one of those classes in a kind of interesting gray area between our full on magical classes and then our, our classes like the fighter and the rogue who at their sort of base form have no magic. The barbarian, because of their rage and some of their other capabilities, are in this interesting realm in between, you know, full on magic over here and no magic yeah. over here. The monk is another example of a class that's in that sort of in between space. And so with that in mind, we decided to relax the restriction on uh, danger sense. We also have made an important tweak to reckless attack. We've now made it so that all of its effects last until the start of your next turn. 
That might seem minor, but it's actually huge because it now means barbarians can benefit from reckless attack on things like uh, an opportunity attack, uh, but also in subclass features like retaliation. And so really, if, if you turn on reckless attack, you're not only gonna benefit from it on the turn you activated it on, but you will also benefit from it should you take a reaction before the start oh, of your yeah, next yeah. turn, okay. like an opportunity attack, and so you're gonna get advantage on, on that attack roll as well. This also has the nice effect of unifying the feature's duration because the way we had it before, essentially the good part for the barbarian lasted only until the end of the turn on which you activated the feature, but the bad part lasted until the start of your next <laughs> turn. So we've decided we're just gonna have one duration for yeah. the entire feature, and that means the barbarian gets that sort of juiciness uh, it, in more circumstances during a battle. Uh, we've also made some level shifts. You're gonna see that in all of the classes, where in a few, a few places, uh, a feature may not have changed in how it functions, but its level has changed. So uh, an example of that is primal knowledge has moved from, uh, has moved to rather level three from level two. Uh, and that was in response to both feedback that it felt like it was crowding out danger sense at level two. Okay. And also we gave primal knowledge with a different function in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything at third level. So we decided to unify there and have that feature now be at third level. Uh, speaking of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, we have also imported, uh, be, responding to popular demand, imported uh, Instinctive Pounce from oh, Tasha's Cauldron. Nice. And you're actually gonna see that a lot in this UA and we will, we will continue to do the same thing for the classes that were in UA6 of bringing over popular tech from Tasha's Cauldron. We, we were intentionally careful about how much we did that earlier in this UA process, partly because we wanted to experiment with some things that weren't in Tasha's, yeah. but we've actually been really gratified how much during the playtest process people have indicated in their comments, oh, I really like that feature from Tasha's. Can yeah. you just give that to us all the time? Yeah, yeah. So you're yeah. gonna see a lot of those features ending up in the final versions uh, of these classes. Uh, we've also restored Brutal Critical to being a die roll, but rather than being a roll of one of your weapon dice, We've made it just, no matter what weapon you're using, it's a D12. Okay. And we did this because we want the Barbarian to feel good about Brutal Critical, no matter what weapon you're wielding. Uh, yeah. Because there used to be this, this, in some cases, feel good because of the weapon you chose and how yeah. it interacted with Brutal Critical. But then other cases where there was feel bad because you, you almost felt like the weapon you were wielding was punishing you yeah. when you sc scored a critical hit. Right. So we've now made it that no matter what you're wielding as a barbarian, if you score a critical hit, you get to add a d12 onto that. Like if you've got a spoon, <laughs> you get to roll d12 on you're that. You're a barbarian. Like, <laughs> yeah. And that goes up. So at 13th level, it increases to 2d12, and then at 17th level to 3d12 that you are adding. Now, some barbarians were already doing that yeah. in 2014, but now we've made it so all barbarians, no matter what you're wielding, you're gonna have truly brutal criticals. And one of the interactions we expect with the barbarian is that you will often be using reckless attack, and anytime you have advantage, you are increasing the odds that you're going to score a critical hit. I bring this up because sometimes we see requests for the Barbarian to have a crit range expander like the Champion Fighter does. And the main reason we have not introduced such a crit range expander to the base Barbarian class is because of reckless attack. And so, in many ways, I think it's good for people to think of Reckless Attack as that is your crit expander. Yeah. Because anytime you're rolling multiple D20s to determine whether you hit or not, you are upping the chance that one of those dice is going to have a 20 on it. 
Yeah. And then we have some uh, things returning to the levels that they were at uh, previously. And because of Primal Champion returning to level 20, uh, it now gives you the, the full plus four to your strength and con that it did in 2014. Perfect. That's a lot. <laughs> what other barbarians are also showing up in this? We have uh, the, the Path of the Berserker, Path of the Wild Heart, Path of the World Tree, and Path of the Zealot. Now, one of those names might have sounded unfamiliar, Path of the Wild Heart. Right. That is the subclass formerly known as the Path of the Totem Warrior. Same subclass, new name. People who've played Baldur's Gate 3 will recognize the yes. name. Yes, yeah. Uh, because that's the name there. And what many people don't know, which I can reveal in this video, is we worked, in, and by we I mean I personally worked with Larian to name that subclass. Yeah. Uh, so, and we knew at the time that we would end up unifying the name when we eventually came to the 2024 Player's Handbook uh, version of the game. So uh, first off, I can really quickly say the Berserker is back, but with very little changed in it. It was super popular the last time we showed it. Right. So we saw, all right, people dig it. Uh, and the only change we've made there is that Intimidating Presence is now a bonus action rather than an action. So it's going to be even easier uh, to strike fear into the hearts of people <laughs> who are around you on the battlefield. Uh, when it comes to uh, Path of the Wild Heart, the, the overall shape of this subclass is the same as it was in 2014, where you have certain supernatural abilities connected to animals, and that includes, you know, you, you gain the ability to use the Beast Sense spell, the Commune with Nature spell, right. and then at the other levels, you pick an animal and you get a characteristic associated with that animal. What's different here is first off, we have retuned many of these options. There are nine of these options, so I'm not gonna go into yeah. every change. <laughs> right. Just as in our videos about changes to meta magic or Eldritch Invocations, we also did yeah. not go into every single well, one. Well, yeah, we, that's why we have a PDF on the, <laughs> yes. on the site, and, right? <laughs> and I encourage people to dive into the design notes, not only yeah. in the Path of the Wild Heart, but in every other section of this PDF, because we have summarized there for you what changed. Uh, the sort of top line of what's changed in these nine different animal options is we have taken some of them that before were lackluster and made them better. And we've taken some, and mostly one, that was wildly overpowered and brought it in line with the others. That one I'm talking about, uh, which probably most barbarian players know what I'm talking about, is the bear option yeah. at level three. Right. So, I have I have to you know I have to tell it to everybody straight that the bear option is no longer going to give you resistance to every damage type but one. Instead, it will now. How are you going to make this up to people? <laughs> instead, you now will choose two damage types that you have resistance to. Right. We've also now made it so that whenever you gain a barbarian level, you can change any of these animal options that you have selected. Okay. Because we want people to really dig into the fantasy of you're drawing on power from different animal aspects, not necessarily one all the time. To help reinforce that theme, we've also renamed six of the nine options. It used to be that they were all bear, eagle, or wolf. And those three were repeated uh, throughout the subclass. Bear, Eagle, and Wolf remain at level three, but at levels six and 14, all the animal names are different. We've done this also partly because people, despite the fact the 2014 rules said otherwise, have sometimes had the misimpression that if they chose bear at the beginning, they had to choose bear all the way through. Or right. if they choose wolf at the beginning, they had to choose wolf all the way through. It's now impossible to have that perception because none of the animal names are repeated. Right. Uh, so now at level six, instead of having uh, eagle, you have owl. Instead of having wolf, you have spider. Instead of having bear, you have elephant, uh, and so on and so forth. And again, you're gonna see a lot of tweaks here that are mostly aimed at trying to make all of these options attractive. 
we know that some of them are more situational than others, which is also why we've uh, made it so that you can swap them out. Yeah. So I think there's going to be a lot of fun for people to play with. Uh, we've, we've talked a little bit about the path of the world tree, brand new subclass, all about tapping into both the life-giving energy of the world tree, but also its uh, planar abilities because the world tree is connected to every world of the multiverse. And so two, two of the main themes you're, you see here are healing and teleportation. Yeah, and, and control. Yes, yeah, because because it's not just teleporting yourself, it's also teleporting others yeah. using the spectral roots and branches of the world tree itself. And so this is all about being the barbarian who is not only resilient and able to provide some resilience for others, but also providing battlefield control. Uh, it's a, again, fun new take uh, for the barbarian. Uh, followed by a revised version of the Path of the Zealot. The last time we saw the Path of the Zealot was Xanathar's Guide to Everything. And if you're already familiar with the subclass, it's, gonna, it's going to look like a familiar friend now. Uh, but again, with some quality of life and balance tweaks. And so like Divine Fury, you now get to determine the damage type that it deals each time you do it. Uh, you with Warrior of the Gods uh, gives you some additional self healing. Uh, now Zealous Presence you can use multiple times between long rests uh, by expending uses of your rage, and uh, Rage Beyond Death you now actually turn into a Warrior Spirit uh, for a limited time. Uh, after you successfully use your Relentless Rage. Nice. And so we expect that each of these features in uh, the Path of the Zealot that people already enjoyed, I think they're going to enjoy them uh, even more. But of course, we'll find out in the surface. <laughs> right. And if it turns out uh, people prefer it the old way, we always have the old way we can return to. Well, I'm very excited for the fighter. I, I mean, I've always loved Eldritch Knight, so, uh, but also I'm so excited for just weapon mastery as well and the shenanigans that are now available. So yeah, let's let's jump in. So uh, in the fighter, we made a number of fun changes that are about essentially taking what people loved in the previous UA yeah. and turning up the volume. So one example right away at first level of us turning up the volume is not only did people previously make it clear they loved weapon mastery, but they especially loved it in the fighter. And so one of the things we've done in the fighter is the fighter now has even more weapon mastery. So fighters now cap out at six weapon masteries. Oh, nice. And uh, people liked the ability that fighters got at higher level to swap out a weapon mastery yeah. property on a weapon for another. Yeah. But there's another example of us turning up the volume it was clear though that they found it unsatisfying that you could switch out only one. So we have we have now created a brand new feature called Master of Armaments, uh, which the fighter uh, gets at level nine, which allows you to swap out the mastery properties on all of your mastery weapons. Nice. Not just one, Yeah. every single one of them. Uh, and so this is going to make it so that the fighter is supremely adaptable in how they use their weapons. And they can turn any weapon into any type of weapon, you know, in a way, like, like that's kind of the fantasy of being a fighter. Like, you can, everything is a threat. <laughs> <laughs> everything in your hands is a weapon. Well, especially uh, in the new Brawler subclass. Yeah. Uh, well, then where that, that is that literally, literally true. <laughs> right, Anything yeah. in their hand uh, can be a, a devastating weapon. Uh, we've also now, uh, and going back to the theme of incorporating things from Tasha's Cauldron. People liked in Tasha's Cauldron the ability to swap out their fighting style feats, so, uh, which was in Tasha's Cauldron in a feature called Martial Versatility. So we've now incorporated that capability right into the fighting style feature. So fighters can now, uh, when they level up, change that, that feat if you don't like the one that you, you chose before. Um, 
We've also, in Second Wind at first level, made a significant change where in addition to now having multiple uses per day, it used to be in 2014 you had a use, right? and then you got that use back on a short rest or a long rest. We changed it in the previous version that fighters start with two per day, and then that number goes up to four as they, as they go up to 20th level. But what we've now also done is we've made it so that whenever the fighter finishes a short rest, the fighter gets one use back. Nice. Uh, so really, and this by the way is a theme that we started leaning into in UA6 and we're leaning into even harder in UA7, is we're ensuring that every class has an incentive to take short rests. So and, it's not just the warlock <laughs> well, <laughs> asking. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it, that, it's funny. That is often the characterization, that it's like yeah. just the warlock. It, actually, every class in our game has something that replenishes on a short rest. But it's absolutely true that the weight that the short rest has for each class is very different. Just as the weight of a long rest is very different for different classes. What's important to us is we want everyone to be glad to take a long rest or a short rest. Yeah. And so you're going to see that in UA 7 and in our future UAs, that coming more and more into focus, where everyone has incentive to be happy about taking a short <laughs> rest or a long yeah. rest. And, and it's interesting, we've even seen some people speculate in the survey questionnaires as well as in online discussions of like the short rest going away. Right. And that, that has never been our plan. We certainly experimented a bit in Tasha's Cauldron with reducing how much classes rely on it, but we never intended to reduce it down to zero and for the revised pH, we're far more interested in, again, giving everyone incentive to take short rests rather than removing people's reliance on it. Right. It's sort of a, us finding where the sweet spot is, which is why we, we've, we've experimented with like turning the volume way down, now yeah. turning it up, and we now feel like, all right, we, I think we found the point that feels right, not only in our extensive internal play testing, but also then in the survey feedback that we receive. So you're gonna see that not only here in the fighter, but elsewhere uh, in this, especially with warlocks returning to using packed magic. Uh, the fighter has uh, a number of quality of life improvements uh, and also lifting of restrictions. So we experimented in the previous version with action surge having a very contained list of actions that you could take. Yeah. This time we're instead lifting all those restrictions except one. And that is saying action surge cannot be used for the magic action. <laughs> uh, because ultimately that is the only action that we're really trying to exclude here. Yeah. Because it action surge was never meant to be where you go to cast more spells or use magic items more times. I have abused this many times. <laughs> so I, I, I know I know there are, I know some folks are going to be sad about this, but I, 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 I cast Eldritch Blast way more often than I should have. <laughs> you know, there are things I've done that were not as intended. Yeah. Yeah. But again, we'll see, we'll see what people think. It, the feedback we got last time was that people acknowledged that there needed to be some kind of limitation, right. but felt that in the last iteration, we went a little too far with limitation. So this time what we're, what we're experimenting with is, we'll just limit the thing that we actually care about. <laughs> because the other stuff, we, we limited those other things largely for thematic reasons. Right. But people rightly pointed out that it's fun having a number of options for role-playing reasons, unusual tactical situations yeah. and whatnot. And so, Rather than trying to enforce a theme here, we decided let's just limit the one that is the concern. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, the fighter has uh, a couple of brand new features this okay. time around. Right at second level, you get a brand new feature called Tactical Mind. And one of the things we have been doing throughout this playtest is looking for ways to give classes that had very little non-combat utility 
some way to contribute more outside combat. Yeah. We already did that in the Barbarian with Primal Knowledge. We've done it in the Ranger. We've done it in different ways in our other classes. Well, this time around, it's the fighter's turn. And so we've introduced this new feature called Tactical Mind that really is all about the fact that fighters are tacticians. Yeah. Uh, they are all about mastering battlefields. And so what we've let you now do is that you have the option of expending uses of second wind to give yourself a d10 that you can roll to add to ability checks uh, oh. that, that you make. So this would be rather than regaining hit points. And this, of course, would be very situational, but we want fighters who not only are able to tap into their stamina for physical purposes, and that's what Second Wind represents, but Tactical Mind represents they also have a well of mental stamina. Yeah. And there are always sessions in most campaigns, occasionally that occur, where there's no combat. And in a session like that, we want a fighter to still have reason to use Second Wind, yeah. uh, one of their main resources, and now they have a use for it. They might even want to use it in a, in a fight. Like sometimes, we've, we've all been in those set piece encounters where often the most important thing is not what you're doing to the monsters, but what you're doing to the MacGuffin on the magic altar. Yeah, yeah. And a, a fighter might find that the clutch move is to actually use tactical mind to ensure they succeed on that critical ability check. Nice. Uh, so then uh, the other brand new feature is at level five. It's called Tactical Shift also plays into second wind. And uh, what it allows you to do is whenever you activate your second wind as a bonus action, you can move up to half your speed without provoking opportunity attacks. Uh, this is uh, the fighter realizing, not only do I need to get some of my hit points back, <laughs> right? maybe I should get out of danger, or maybe I should move over there to protect oh, my yeah, friend, yeah. or maybe I should move over here where I'm in a more advantageous position to fire my bow at that person. Again, leaning into this notion of the fighter as the tactical master. And, and also us exploring, giving the fighter some more active uh, things to do with their class features, which is also the motivation behind the weapon mastery system, is give the fighter and the barbarian and other weapon-focused characters fun, active things to do on their turns. Uh, we also, at level 13, have a yet another brand new feature in the fighter uh, called Studied Attacks. And this represents this tactical master studying their opponent. And how we represent that is if the fighter makes an attack roll against someone and misses, they have advantage on their next attack roll against that same target. So it's essentially, I, I thrust and I missed, but I saw how you dodged it. Mm -hmm. So on my next attack, I have a greater chance of hitting you. Uh, really, again, going into this theme of fighters being the master of the battlefield. Uh, and then we've got the subclasses. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot, that's a lot. Okay, we've, uh, we've been doing a lot. <laughs> been, yeah, I'm very aware. Uh, what, what, what's the first fighter on the agenda? So we have the Battle Master. The Battle Master has long been uh, one of the most popular yeah. subclasses for the fighter. We've seen some requests for the Battle Master to be dismantled and its maneuvers given to the base class. Yeah. That is something we explored early on in our work for the 2024 Player's Handbook. We ended up not going in that direction and instead introducing weapon mastery for, for a number of reasons, but the two main ones that I'll talk about right now is, first off, people love this subclass. Yeah. What we did not want to do is just eliminate it for the sake of all the other subclasses. Right. Also, the battle master represents a style of play having this pool of dice that you keep track of to spend on a variety of different micro effects that it's just simply not for everybody who is attracted to being a fighter. Right. Yeah. Uh, because we know from nearly a decade now of going through player feedback, there are many people who love playing fighters who have no interest in what the Battlemaster does. 
So we decided we're going to let the battle master keep being the battle master uh, and uh, just enhance other subclasses and the base class in ways that are appropriate. This plus weapon mastery must be particularly nasty now <laughs> in terms of like tactical options. So yeah, the battle master, I mean, the it's in the name. Yeah. They are a master of battle. I mean, it's already, they're already in the class that is the, you know, the tactical master, the, the master of the battlefield. So you can almost think of the battle master as that plus one. Yeah. And here uh, we have mostly made some quality of life improvements like Student of War now also gives you a proficiency in a skill. Uh, we've made um, Know Your Enemy way easier to use and we think more reliably useful right. because it was, it was a neat thematic ability previously, but not always that useful and also not easy to use in battle. Uh, and now it is. Now Know Your Enemy is a bonus action. Nice. Rather than needing to study pe oh, someone yeah. for a long time outside of combat, that's great. You also now with relentless in in this subclass. Once you reach fifteenth level, uh, you now once per turn can use a maneuver without expending a superiority die. Oh, wow. okay. Uh, so that will that will help extend the life of your superiority die pool. We have also, and this is a common theme when we get to collections of smaller mechanics, we did this in Metamagic, we've done this in Eldritch Inv Invocations, we have now revisited every one of the maneuver options and a number of them have gotten tweaks in most cases to make them easier or more fun to use. I encourage people to go to the design note yeah, to see all of the details. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there's a lot to play with, a lot of combos to like come up with. And also an important thing uh, to note here is we've also imported some of the maneuver options that we introduced in Tasha's Cauldron. Yeah. Uh, because uh, people, the last time uh, we did the fighter in the playtest, we even though the battle master wasn't in the playtest, we were already getting requests for us to import some of those maneuvers from Tasha's. Yeah. So here they are. The brawler, new subclass. We've chatted about it. This is the the badass who is going to beat that monster uh, with a chicken wing or whatever it is to hand. That is a thing that, you know, is just a, it's very in popular culture. Someone who kind of like those Bane characters who can just, they are lethal all the time. They don't need any particular thing in their hands and they're not necessarily the monk. They're just someone who everything is a weapon. And in some ways you can almost think of the brawler as uh, the antithesis of the battle master. Right. The battle master is this studied tactical fighter who can bolster allies, carefully use these maneuvers, manage this uh, pool of dice. Yeah. Whereas the brawler is just the messy, dirty fighter yeah. of <laughs> Which this, everyone loves. this rock yeah. is what I'm using now <laughs> in this fight. And <laughs> and we just felt that that archetype was missing from yeah. the fighter. And so we're excited uh, to offer it here. The champion returns and uh, the champion has several tweaks based on the previous version. The previous version was well received. We were super happy to see that a subclass that has sometimes struggled uh, to reach a high satisfaction score right. finally did. Uh, and we have brought back Remarkable Athlete. We saw people requesting that and we've made it a little clearer on uh, its functionality. What I mean by that is clever players who read it carefully realized that it benefited their initiative roles. We did not want that to continue to be this thing that only master players figured out. Mm -hmm. So we've now made it so that Remarkable Athlete just straight up tells you, rather than getting a set bonus, you now have just, you have advantage on initiative rolls and you have advantage on strength athletics checks. Uh, and you also get your long jump distance increased. Uh, so we wanted it to be, put it on the tin, what this feature does, right, whereas yeah. before it, when you did a quick read, it wasn't always clear in the 2020-14 version 
what is this for? Other than the very obvious, my jump distance increases. Yeah. We also have improved the new feature that we introduced last time, Heroic Warrior, and have now made it so that um, you can give yourself heroic advantage at the start of every one of your turns that you start without it. Yeah. Meaning, you can give yourself advantage to use once on each of your turns. This is meant to work with their expanded crit range. Yeah, you have even more of that chance. Exactly. Uh, the Eldritch Knight is here. Uh, so for everyone who loves the, the, the classic warrior mage archetype, yep. we, we've got you covered. Uh, and the main changes here is after level three, we have lifted the spell school res restriction that Eldritch Knights had on some of their spell selection. Uh, so you'll have more flexibility now. Nice. We've also clarified that you can use an arcane focus uh, when you're casting your spells. And then we've tweaked how both uh, war magic and uh, also improved war magic function. Okay. So we've now made it so that you can keep, as a fighter, taking the attack action on your turn and you can now replace one of your attacks with a cantrip. Yeah. It used to be kind of the other way around, where if you used your action to cast a spell, you could make an attack as a bonus action. Yeah. What we found is that that caused the Eldritch Knight's average damage to, in most cases, be lower than the typical fighter. The fighter and the barbarian, on average, over the life of a campaign, will on average deal more damage than members of most other classes. Other classes have higher peaks. Yeah. Other classes will have moments of damage that exceed the fighter and the barbarian, but they are the energizer bunnies. They're yeah. the ones Consistently who can, dealing. can consistent deal a reliable amount of damage. Uh, but that was undermined in the Eldritch Knight by having essentially this encouragement for the Eldritch Knight to cast a spell instead of taking the attack action. And this was rough for a class where one of their main features is they get more attacks than anybody else. Yeah. So we've now fixed that in the Eldritch Knight so that uh, now it's instead the other way around. Keep taking that attack action, but you can now replace one of those attacks with a cantrip. And then when you get improved war magic, you can then, you also have the option of replacing two of your attacks and remember, when a fighter gets high enough level, they have four attacks. Yeah. You can replace two of them to cast a level one or level two spell. Nice. Uh, so I think this is going to make it so that the Eldritch Knight can way better fulfill that fantasy of being a potent uh, warrior mage. Nice. I am excited to talk about the Sorcerer. I am a giant fan of wild magic, but I will put that aside. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's changed? So uh, since the last time that people saw this class, uh, we have taken some of those class-specific spells that we experimented with, and we've turned them either into non-spell features or into spells on the sorcerer spell list, uh, and then evolved them a bit. So an example of that, innate sorcery is a first level feature now that allows you to enter almost like a arcane rage where for one minute after you activate it, the spell save DC of your sorcerer spells increases by one and you have advantage on the attack rolls of your sorcerer spells. Nice. This then is an ability that gets enhanced by several later features. We are continuing to explore this notion of this boiling magic inside the sorcerer and giving it expression in game mechanics. And innate sorcery, I think, is a really fun way of expressing that. Yeah. Of, of in, in a way that the sorcerer getting to decide, I'm going to open the funnel wider, you know, in yeah, terms of yeah. letting the, the, the energy out. Uh, and so uh, an examples of how this feature gets enhanced at higher levels, uh, eventually 
it gets to the point where when it's on, the sorcerer can use two metamagics per spell instead of only one. And then its sort of ultimate form is you then get a metamagic on, on your castings that costs you no sorcery points. Uh, and uh, that is something that will also help extend the life of your sorcery point pool, uh, which we know is often uh, a, a pain point for yeah. sorcerers. Yeah. Now, resource management is something that is a part of every class in our game. So yeah. that, is, that is something that we won't get rid of, but we are mindful of where is it painful rather than fun and interesting. We want it to yeah. be fun and interesting, not painful. And, and so speaking of shepherding your sorcery points, we have taken the sorceress restoration feature from level 15 and brought it all the way down to level five. Oh, wow. And this now gives you a, a certain number of sorcery points back whenever you roll initiative and have none remaining. Yeah. And this will then scale up because it's based on your sorcerer level and it starts as you just get one back yeah. if you roll initiative and have none remaining. And then it will, it will go up to the four that it was before. So we decided rather than making you wait until almost the end of your career to have this function, yeah. we now give you the function way earlier and then it will scale up with you. And people are gonna see in our next version of The Monk, for instance, people are gonna see similar tech there uh, where we're already going through feedback on uh, UA6 for the survey and we were working on this Unearthed Arcana while people were surveying for that. And we were already improving a number of these sort of point management systems here. Yeah. And so the monk will get to benefit from that when the monk gets its second version. Perfect. Some further tweaks in the metamagic options. Not many though, because overall people loved what we did with metamagic last time. The main thing that we have changed here is we have yet another version of Twin Spell. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Twin Spell was actually the only metamagic option that didn't score well last time around. And uh, so we have another version here. Uh, this time around, uh, because people were really hungry for having that sort of second target option back. Yeah. But as I explained in another video, we cannot do it the way it was done in 2014 because right. that version, just the math of it was way off. Uh, it, it cost far too few sorcery points. And then if we were able to make it cost the appropriate number of sorcery points, Prohibitive. You, you wouldn't even be able to use the feature until you were near the end of your career. Right. Also, the old twin spell had the problem of requiring a lot of complexity in terms of figuring out which spells it actually worked with. Right. So we are committed to, we are not bringing back the overpowered version that would have to become prohibitively expensive if we kept it. We are also not bringing back that complexity. But we hear people about wanting to be able to cast a spell that normally targets one person and now they want to make it target two. Right. So this time around, what we're doing is we're making it so that Twin Spell can modify spells like Charm Person and Hold Person, where currently, if you read the spell and you go down and look at the At Higher Level section, it will tell you if you cast this spell with a higher level spell slot, you can target an additional uh, person. Yeah, yeah. Twin Spell now functions with those spells and, and spells like them, where what it lets you do is essentially up-level the spell to get that additional target and do that up-leveling for a very modest sorcery point cost. Uh, and so basically we're bringing back yeah. the multi-targeting <laughs> and it is now limited to the spells that we have designed to actually step-by-step step increase the number of targets. Right. And now you can do it at a much lower cost than spending a higher level spell slot. The other good news here is as we revise the spells in the game, quite a few spells that did not have an at higher level section in 2014 
will now have such a section in 2024. People can see that in this UA in the jump spell, where the jump spell did not have an IR, yeah, at higher levels yeah. before. It now does. And it's at higher levels is exactly this kind, where if you cast it with a higher level slot, you can target more people. It's also something I keep in mind when I'm playing a Warlock as well, is like, okay, well, am I getting the most, you know, personally out of this? Since I'm like having to cast it at the, the highest I can, mm -hmm. like, does it make sense for me to use that on a spell that does not scale? And, and so now the Sorcerer can use Twin Spell with this new version to get that extra target yeah. and not have to spend the next higher level spell slot to do so. And then you're erasing the concentration issue as well, like for whole oh, person's concentration. So Correct. And that's the other thing that we are comfortable bringing back in is people noted that the version that we play tested before no longer allowed you to uh, essentially feel like you were concentrating on two spells at once. Yeah. Um, not something we're comfortable uh, giving out too freely. Yeah. Whereas in this new version of the twin spell, because it's enhancing spells that are already designed to up-level into having multiple targets, gotcha. you are now concentrating on just one spell with multiple targets. Gotcha. So it solves a number of issues. Nice. Uh, Draconic Sorcery is back. And uh, probably the main change here is the wings are back to being on all the time. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we have also brought back a uh, Draconic Presence, and we've made it now a bonus action, and it no longer requires concentration. Nice. So Draconic Presence is going to be easier to use and less painful to use. Right. Uh, Wild Magic Sorcery is here we go. also here. <laughs> and the main request we've gotten over the years is to make it more reliable for the Wild Sorcerer to actually get to interact with their big wonky table of fun effects. Yeah, the, the, the core of what makes them fun and, and not having to ask your dungeon master all the time. Exactly. So we have we have we listened and we have delivered. Um, and now immediately after you cast the sorcerer spell of level one or higher, you can roll on the wild magic surge table. Yes. Full stop. Yes. You can just do it. Um, I feel like there's more of this friend pressure from me. <laughs> <laughs> I love chaos. Uh, yeah. But, but yes. once you do this, yeah. you then can't do it again until you finish a long rest. However, we have built in, and I know you know this because you read the revised subclass, yeah. we, have re we have built in ways for you to get that ability back. Yeah. Uh, Tides of Chaos has it. Uh, and so there's going to be this fun mini game of, all right, I tapped into the wild magic yes. and now I want to use Tides of Chaos so then I can tap into it again. Uh, and I think it's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, Bend Luck is now a D6 instead it, of a D4. Right. Uh, and now uh, Wild Bombardment lets you interact with the wild magic table even more. And wild bombardment is the new name of spell bombardment. Right. As far as the table goes, you'll notice it is not in the UA uh, because we're using the table that's in the 2014 player's handbook. So nice. if you're playtesting this version of the subclass, you've got that, that massive table right there in your book. These are the only two subclasses in this UA. As we note uh, within it, the other two subclasses that are on the docket to appear in the 2024 PH for the Sorcerer are uh, Aberrant Sorcery, yeah. formerly known as Aberrant Mind, and uh, Clockwork Sorcery, uh, formerly known as the Clockwork Soul. Uh, and what we ask you to do here is if you want to play test those subclasses with this version of the Sorcerer, you can use the versions that are in Tasha's Cauldron. Yeah. Those subclasses are recent enough in our design that uh, we don't currently have in any significant changes for them. Yeah. Let's go into the Warlock, the non-controversial Warlock. <laughs> I, think, I think this version of the, the Warlock is delightful. Uh, after our experiment of not having pack magic, yeah. pack magic is back uh, in, in this version of the Warlock. And 
we saw in the playtest feedback how much people really want this feature to stay yeah. in the class. Uh, so the, the playtest did its job, which was to answer that question, how important was it? Uh, and But we still have our goal, which was, and for anyone who saw our videos about the last version of the Warlock, right. I talked about the fact one of our main reasons for experimenting with replacing pack magic was to let the Warlock cast their spells more often. Yeah. Pack magic, because of how it works, of the spells all going up to uh, the Warlock's highest slot level, it's really constrained in terms of the Warlock's spell list. It's also constrained in terms of number of slots. But again, we also know that people are like, but can we cast our spells a few more times? Yeah. So in answer to that, and to accompany the return of pack magic, we have introduced a new feature uh, at level two called Magical Cunning. And Magical Cunning lets uh, a warlock perform a one minute ritual to then regain a certain number of their pack magic spell slots. Nice. They can do this only once per day, yeah. but this is a big deal because what this means is that in addition to being able to get their spell slots back on short rests and long rests, they also have this ability uh, that they can do now once per day at low level. And that's not a nice thematic thing as well, of being able to, you know, you, Warlocks in my head, there's always a ritual happening. There's always like candles and creepy stuff. So having that a little bit, take, take a minute and like do something creepy and then get a spell slot <laughs> back. But it's always gonna be creepy, yeah. And this is similar to something we did in the Sorcerer where we took a very high level feature yeah. that gave you your core resource back and gave you a low level version of it. So here, how we did that is Magical Cunning is basically a low level version of Eldritch Master. Yeah. And so the new version of Eldritch Master that is now back in the Warlock now builds on Magical Cunning because we essentially give you a little mini Eldritch Master early yeah, yeah. and then you, you blossom into it later in your career. Uh, and again, people will see in the next version of the Monk a uh, similar kind of approach nice. of, of bringing some of that resource restoration lower level yeah, and on. then have it bloom into the fuller version that people are accustomed to. Uh, other things that are, are big in the Warlock is Mystic Arcanum is back in the base class and the contact patron feature that we introduced last time um, uh, is here to stay, people really like it, yeah. but it's at a lower level than it was last time. Otherwise, the base Warlock class right now looks very similar to the 2014 Warlock. Where the main changes are, other than Contact Patron being here and Magical Cunning being a new feature at second level, is we have taken the Pact Boons feature and absorbed it into Eldritch Invocations. Okay. In contrast, Mystic Arcanum is back to being a core feature and not a part of Eldritch Invocations. Gotcha. People correctly pointed out that having Mystic Arcanum inside the Eldritch Invocations subsystem made it so that people felt like they had to spend a lot of their Eldritch Invocation options on Mystic Arcanum. So we pulled Mystic Arcanum back outside Eldritch Invocations but we put Pact Boons into the Eldritch Invocations pool. Here's the reason we did this. We want you to be able to have more than one. We actually, for a long time, uh, have felt that Pact of the Blade and Pact of the Tome are really the starting choices. Pact of the Chain and then Pact of the Talisman and Tasha's Cauldron are really add-on boons and are not meant to have the same function for your character. Pact of the Blade and Pact of the Tome are really about your Warlock's sort of core combat style. Yeah. Are you more about a weapon or are you more about spellcasting? Even though all Warlocks are spellcasters. Yeah. It's, so it's not, a, it's not a kind of either or thing, it's really just... Where, where you, are you leaning? Where are you leaning? Yeah. And when we were looking at the feedback and seeing people rightly pointing out 
Pact of the Chain, for instance, have a, has a very different power profile for a warlock, and people were requesting or musing about that becoming as spicy as Blade and Tome. And we realized, well, it's never been meant to be as spicy as those two. And then the deeper we thought about it, we realized, and we don't want you picking one of those two, blocking you from having an enhanced familiar. Right. And this one thing led to another, and we realized, these are eldritch invocations. And we're actually okay with you having more than one of them. This means at higher level, if you chose Pact of the Blade or Pact of the Tome at first level, and remember, these used to be available only at third level. Yeah. So now you get to pick one of these two at first level. You could then pick the other one later. Yeah. This is going to make Warlocks even more customizable than they were before. Because of us moving these options into the invocations pool and people always wanting more invocations, we have now increased the invocation cap again, and it now goes all the way up to 10 nice. at, at 20th level. Well, actually, you hit 10 at 18th level. Uh, and speaking of invocations, there are a lot of revisions to individual invocations based on the feedback that we got. You're going to see many invocations have lower level prereqs, and, and not just, in some cases, one or two levels lower. Like Master of Myriad Forms went from requiring you to be a level 15 warlock to being a level 5 warlock. Nice. And so there are a lot of things that are going to come online way earlier than they did uh, for the warlock before. Uh, we have also made a number of enhancements to Pact of the Blade because as much as people liked some of what we did last time, they pointed out it still needs some oomph to compete with uh, Pact of the Tome. Yeah. And so there now are enhancements not only in Pact of the Blade, but we also have brought Thirsting Blade back and it also has an improvement inside it. And yeah. so you now have some damage boosts and also number of attack boosts in Pact of the Blade, uh, and then in some of the Eldritch Invocations, should you decide to lean even harder into that direction, that will make it so that you can really feel like an effective weapon user. Or, remember, since now you can dabble, yeah, yeah. you might be a Pact of the Tome, primarily a Pact of the Tome Warlock, but like, oh, but I also like the ability to pull out to summon up this spectral weapon and whack somebody with it. So I'm gonna have a little bit of that fun too. Yeah. And so you can mix and match. And Am I correct in the fact that the Elder's Smite is back? Yes. We have also uh, imported uh, some more invocations from Tasha's Cauldron and Xanathar's Guide. Um, Eldritch Smite was an invocation we introduced in Xanathar's Guide and <clears throat> we wanna move it to the player's handbook. I encourage people to dive into the long design note for the Eldritch Invocations because there are many tweaks there, both big and small. Perfect. When it comes to Warlock subclasses, huh. uh, the Fiend is back uh, with several tweaks. Overall, this subclass uh, was really loved in the previous uh, playtest. So we, we saw that and we're like, all right, we're, we're going to keep the shape of it and just make some improvements. Uh, and that includes some clarifications to hurl through hell, as well as there's now a saving throw at the front end rather than the back, because right. people correctly pointed out that it was far too easy to just send anybody yeah. <laughs> hurling through the lower planes. Yeah. And so we have addressed that. Uh, we've also made it now, we've reduced the damage of hurl through hell a little bit. Um, so that we could also apply the incapacitated condition to the person being hurled through hell. Uh, because it was actually too easy for certain creatures uh, to bypass this with certain abilities, like, for instance, the ability to plane shift or, you know, just 
poof, right out of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've decided we actually don't want people doing things while they're hurtling through the lower planes. <laughs> so they're, they're now incapacitated. We have the Feywild, and this is a very misty step teleporter. <laughs> okay, so yes, the Arch Fey Patron. Yeah. The Arch Fey Patron, its features, <clears throat> other than Misty Escape in 2014, uh, were all low scoring when we did our big player's handbook survey in 2021. They, all of them were in the 60s, uh, other than Misty Escape. What that told us is we need to take a whack at redesigning this subclass, uh, but keep that one feature people really liked. Yeah, yeah. And so what you're now going to see here is us really leaning into two of the main Fae themes in D and D, for for characters and monsters, and that is the charm condition yeah. and teleportation, and that teleportation appears in a big way right at level three, where you always have misty step prepared. You can cast it a certain number of times per day without using spell slots, and you have some add-on effects uh, that you can apply to this teleportation. Yeah. This is similar thematically to what we did with Eladrin, uh, the playable species, and that similarity is intentional because this is the warlock who is tapping into the same fey magic as Eladrin. But uh, this is it's a different mechanism here. This yeah. is this is built on you specifically casting the Misty Step spell and we modify it over time. So now Misty Escape uh, lets you cast Misty Step as a reaction in response to taking damage and also gives you a couple more effects that you have the option of applying. And you can apply just one yeah. each time you cast Misty Step. But when you get to uh, level six, you will now have four options, a little menu of four that you can choose from each time you cast Misty Step. Uh, to add on an additional effect. It's gonna be fun. Yes. Uh, we, <laughs> I want to get into a. I want to get into a fight immediately. <laughs> uh, we also now then we have at level ten beguiling defenses. You're immune to the charm condition just as you were in 2014, but now also we've made it so that if someone has the cheek to hit you with an attack roll, uh, you can essentially beguile them into taking some of that damage themselves, yeah. <laughs> which is a very fey thing to do. Um, and then finally, we have a new feature at level 14 where it allows you, every time you cast an enchantment spell or an illusion spell using a spell slot, you can also cast Misty Step as a part of the same action that you used to cast this, that other spell and you can do so without expending a spell slot. It's fantastic. And to interact with this feature, most of the spells on your patron spell list are enchantments and illusions. Yeah. And so you just, you are going to be Bamping just everywhere. missed yeah. all over. Um, really our effort here is to give the Arch Fey a distinctive play style that really sets it apart from the other Warlock subclasses. That with Eldritch Blast and being able to push and pull people around with those invocations is going to be a very interesting combat technician, potentially. <laughs> yes, yes. In the Warlock, we also have the Celestial Patron. Yes. And the Celestial, the last time we saw them was in uh, Xanathar's Guide to Everything. And they are now here just with a few minor yeah. tweaks. Uh, they are here with an improved patron spells feature where they now have all these spells prepared. Uh, and then uh, Celestial Resilience now interacts with the new Magical Cunning feature. Very nice. Now, the Great Old One subclass, it has more tweaks than that. Yeah. Uh, so in addition to having the improved patron spells feature that all the warlock subclasses now have, uh, its awakened mind feature now gives you a more useful telepathy. Uh, the 2014 version was this one-way communication. We've now made it so that you can 
create two-way communication with a single creature. And then we've, at level six, made it so that you have a feature that plays on this, where you yep. can then use... Weaponized it. Yes, you can weaponize your telepathic communication <laughs> yeah. with somebody, because we want to, to really dig in deeper to this spooky, cosmic horror, tele telepathy yeah. angle. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, it got spookier. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we, we also gave you a new feature at level 10 called Eldritch Hex, where you get the Hex spell for free and you, and you have enhancements to how you use it. We're doing this partly because the Great Old One honestly needed a damage boost yeah. uh, relative to the other subclasses, and Eldritch Hex uh, is the is our way one of our ways of doing that in in addition to clairvoyant combatant, uh, which is the the feature at level six, uh, and then at level fourteen we have a completely different functionality in create thrall, and that is you getting to cast the summon aberration spell, which is currently in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything but which will appear in the 2024 Player's Handbook. In fact, I can spoil now <laughs> that all the summoning spells from Tasha's will be in the 2024 Player's Handbook. Fantastic. Any, anyone who likes conjuring monsters, that those were so nice to have. And we felt, of all of these subclasses, the one that really should be pulling some horror from another realm, <laughs> it is the great old one It's Warlock. fair, it's fair. So let's talk about the wizard. We've got the wizard and a couple subclasses. So the wizard, we heard loud and clear last time that people wanted the return of the wizard's dedicated spell list. And that's one of the reasons all the classes have gone back to using their own spell lists, as, along with the warlock going back to pack magic. It also assists the bard's identity and a variety of other reasons. It will also clean up some things in the ranger yeah. uh, where we we to preserve the ranger's uh, exclusive access to things like conjure barrage and conjure volley, had to build them in as class features. Yeah. Uh, since the ranger was sharing a list with the druid, yeah, yeah. We, all that stuff can now go away uh, now that we're back to class spell lists. So the wizard, we had fun with some of the spells we introduced last time, like modify spell, create spell. There was a mix of tremendous excitement about those spells right. and also a lot of dread <laughs> at what, what they could do to yeah. certain play environments, concern about is this eating the sorcerer's metamagic lunch. We saw the feedback and we decided we're gonna put those back on the shelf. And so modify spell and create spell are no longer here. Memorize spell is still here. Uh, but now it is a non-spell feature rather than a spell given to you by a feature. Right. Arcane Recovery has returned to first level uh, to make it easier for wizards to get some spell slots back right away uh, when they start their careers uh, on a short rest uh, because spell slots are the wizard's bread and butter. Yeah. Uh, because the wizard does not have intentionally that many other features going on. Yeah. The wizard's main feature is they interact with spells more flexibly than anybody else and also with a list that is longer than anybody else's. Right. Leaning into that, uh, we have imported from Tasha's Cauldron uh, the ability for the wizard to change their cantrips more often than just when they level up. Uh, that was called Cantrip Formulas in Tasha's Cauldron. It's now here in uh, the Player's Handbook version of the class. Wizard Spellbook, we experimented with it as its own feature. It's now been folded back into the spellcasting feature. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Academic, that feature has been replaced by a similarly named one called Scholar, right. uh, which is about giving you uh, expertise in a skill that is wizard appropriate. Nice. Given the fact that wizards are the scholarly class. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, should, they should be good at arcana. <laughs> yes, uh, or whatever scholarly pursuit yes. uh, the wizard has chosen. Uh, one of the changes at high level 
in spell mastery is one, we've made it so that it's easier for you to change what those spells are, but we have also made it so that those spells can no longer be bonus actions or reactions. We have realized, not only in our own play, but also reading the playtest feedback, that allowing a high-level wizard to cast shield, for example, at will, it is simply too good. Yeah. And that is why people will see that spell mastery is now limited to spells that require an action to cast. Gotcha. Uh, and honestly, that was our original design intent, and we simply didn't think a decade ago to exclude bonus actions and reactions, and now we're like, okay, it's time for us to do it. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the subclasses, uh, the evoker, uh, the big change in the evoker is that uh, sculpt spells and potent cantrip have switched places. Oh, interesting. Sculpt spells used to be a level three feature and potent cantrip was level six. The problem was very few spells when you were a level three wizard actually benefited from sculpt spells. And at those lower levels, you're especially relying on your cantrips. And so we decided, let's switch this so that the evoker can really enjoy those potent cantrips at the levels when they would be most valuable and can start sculpting spells at the level when most of the evoker's main AOE spells are coming online. Right, right. Uh, so I think, I think this is a, it's one of those things that seems minor, just flipping the level, but I think in play, uh, it will be a significant upgrade to the Evoker's play experience. Nice. We also have the Abjurer, the Diviner, and the Illusionist who are here. Uh, the Abjurer uh, has several nice tweaks. Uh, one, of one, one of those is you can now, with your Arcane Ward, simply burn a spell slot to replenish your ward's hit points rather than sort of having to jump through the hoop of casting an appropriate spell yeah, to do it. Yeah. And instead it can just be, I simply need this thing right now to have more hit points. Yeah. And I don't have a spell that I want to cast right now. Yeah. Uh, and so we have, in a way, cut out that middle step, <laughs> yeah. um, which that step is still there if you want it, where casting an abjuration spell restores hit points. We've just now given you another way of restoring those hit points. Uh, we have also replaced improved abjuration in the abjurer with a new feature called Spellbreaker. And what Spellbreaker does is it gives you dispel magic prepared all the time, and you can cast it as a bonus action, and you can add your proficiency bonus to the oh, ability wow. check you make inside it. Nice. Making you, as it says in the feature name, a Spellbreaker. Nice. which is very much the identity of the Abjurer. The previous improved Abjuration had that add your proficiency bonus to the ability check part. That's the one piece we've preserved. And that's about all it did. Yeah. It, it did that, it added that to uh, Dispel Magic and also to Counterspell. And the few other very rare spells that include an ability check, we decided, let's just give you Dispel Magic and make it awesome. Yeah. Uh, also, Counterspell, as people will see in this very Unearthed Arcana, no longer includes an ability check, and so the old improved Abjuration would have had no interaction oh, with that okay. spell. Gotcha. Diviner is a hugely popular subclass. Yes. <clears throat> so we did very little to it. Yeah. Um, the main thing we did is uh, we've made it so that the third eye feature is now a bonus action to activate. Having the incapacitated condition no longer shuts it off. And we essentially folded two of the options into one. So you now no longer have to choose between seeing into the ethereal plane and seeing invisible creatures because we now let you instead just cast C invisibility without expending a spell slot. Right. And that spell does both of those things. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we really just, we improved it so it's, the feature is easier to use 
and you're not having to kind of choose between two things when instead we just give you both of them combined in one. Uh, finally, we have the illusionist, and in the illusionist, we have made it so that malleable illusions is a bonus action instead of an action, so easier to alter illusions that you have running. Uh, we've made it so that now illusory self can be reused uh, by expending a spell slot of level two or higher. And then illusory reality has simply been clarified a little bit. Uh, people pointed out that in the old version it used to say the this thing that you make can't deal damage or deal any other harm. And it was, people point out, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> like emotional? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it is now much clearer. It says, and I'll read it right, right from the doc, the object can't deal damage or give any conditions. Perfect. That now it is clear. So that's the wizard. Uh, I, I will mention real quick because wizard players will certainly care about it, as will sorcerers, warlocks, and others. We not only have a fun new version of jump in this UA, but also a new version of counterspell. Right. The, the new version of jump is a bonus action instead of an action. Nice. It can be cast at higher levels to affect multiple people, and it is no longer reliant on your speed. This is significant because the 2014 version of jump was a spell that in addition to you having to spend your whole action on it, had some hidden feel bad in it if you then went and looked at the jump rules. Yeah. Because the spell very simply just says, your jump distance is tripled. But anyone who knows our jump rules knows that when you jump, you have to spend movement for every foot of your jump. And the jump spell didn't give you any extra speed. Gotcha. So while it might have tripled your jump distance, it didn't give you any additional speed to actually make use of all of that distance. Right. So you could, you could often with certain characters, depending on what their strength was, since jumps are based on your strength, get this tripling, but it's like, but I don't have enough movement to even use this extra distance. So we have now given you the ability with this spell to take this sort of fun hop uh, with it, um, where on each of your turns you can burn 10 feet of movement to jump 30 feet. And okay. you can do that once per turn. And you'll see it has nothing to do with whatever your speed is. Uh, the new counter spell has some significant changes in it. And really the heart of the redesign of counter spell is we have now made it so that the spell is mindful of your target. The old counterspell had a really significant issue in it, and that is it was too closely based on Dispel Magic. Dispel Magic is based on the level of the spell you're trying to dispel. Counterspell did the same thing, where you are, you are trying to dispel a spell, I mean, I'm sorry, counter a spell, and it's based on that spell's level. Here's the problem. Counterspell isn't dispelling a spell. The whole story, and this even the 2014 version said this, is you are attempting to interrupt a creature casting a spell. Right. The creature is the target, not the spell. Okay. And one of the huge issues with Counterspell in its 2014 form is it was no harder to counter a Arch Lich than it was a sixth level wizard. Um, and we needed to correct that. It, yeah because it really needed to account for the might of the spellcaster. And so with that in mind, Counterspell now uh, is a saving throw that the target makes. It's a constitution save, just like concentration saving throws are constitution saves. And the spell is only interrupted if they fail their saving throw. What this means is not only higher CR monsters will be harder to counter than lower CR monsters, but also flip it around because sometimes monsters cast counter spell. It means a higher level player character uh, will be able to yeah. resist being countered more than a lower level player character. But wait, there's more. We've also made it so that counter spell is not a double penalty. And what I mean by that is in 2014, 
if you succeeded at countering a spell, you not only wasted that spellcaster's action uh, or bonus action or reaction that they used to cast that spell, you also wasted the spell slot that they used to cast it if they used a spell slot for it. Right. That is actually a larger punishment than the spell is meant to be. And so people will see that in the new version, Counterspell will still essentially waste the action, bonus action, or reaction that was used to cast the spell, but it does not expend the spell slot. Oh, okay. Uh, and the narrative here is think of it as since you interrupted them in the process of casting, they never completed casting the spell. Right, right. And so the resource is not expended, at least the spell slot is not. If they were using some other resource, yeah, it's still gone. Um, but the, if it's a spell slot, they still have it. Yeah. Which means you can no longer counter someone's ninth level spell and their one ninth level spell yeah, slot for the yeah. day is gone. Yeah. It, but it does mean they still lost their action. Um, but that's, again, much more where the power was meant to be in counter spell, is to be able to say nope to that spell in this moment, not, and I've also deprived you of one of your core resources for the rest of the day. Uh, so I look forward to people playtesting this new version of Counterspell and Jump, uh, and I'm excited to find out what people think of everything in this UA as well as the UAs ahead of us. Perfect, and that is Unearthed Arcana 7. Uh, it's quite large, and it should be available right now on D&D Beyond, so go check that out and look through the PDF and give us your feedback. Thank you so much for watching. Bye, everyone.